Welcome to another episode of We Are Carbon. I'm Helen Fisher and I'm joined by Lara Hussein for a discussion that finds great power within the simple. We all know of nature's ability to compost, to take what's been grown and break it back down to be recycled over and over again. But as a society, we've pretty much neglected the value of this. In fact, we've become so detached from it that many people find the whole thing rather gross and unthinkable quantities of organic matter are being dumped into landfills across the globe every day. We've heard previously that worldwide our soils are becoming depleted, and yet so much of our plant waste is being taken out of the loop. If there were ever anything that could clearly illustrate the tunnel vision that we've given ourselves through focusing on technological solutions, it's got to be this. Simple and accessible steps that we can all be a part of are right at our fingertips. And once we engage with something like composting, it's quite extraordinary how it keeps expanding out with added benefits. This is the cycle of life itself, after all. Lara and co-founder Chaylan were enchanted by the magic of compost too, and concerned with the absence of collection facilities for making food scrap repurposing a part of people's busy lives. They founded the Waste Lab in their home of Dubai and have made it their mission to build a new type of waste management, one that reconnects people with their food and the soil that it was grown from. And while they focus on compost, new opportunities to partner up and repurpose food in unique and valuable ways keep arriving. We discuss how this simple starting point is growing outwards through a web of collaborative connections. You can keep up to date with everything from We Are Carbon by subscribing over on the website, wearecarbon.earth, or find us on Instagram, at wearecarbon.earth. Right, let's get stuck in. Good morning, Lara. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, We're here to talk about your venture, The Waste Lab, which is really exciting with regards to the work that you're doing to start up collecting and composting food scraps within your location in Dubai. And it would be fantastic if you could introduce yourself to get us going and also a little bit of background as to what got you into this business itself. Sure. Uh, Hi, Helen. Uh, Thank you for having me. My name is Lara. And I am the the co-founder of The Waste Lab. And The Waste Lab is an impact-driven young startup. Uh, It's also woman-owned. And we are here on a mission to make sure that food is never wasted, no matter where it is across the food chain. And uh, we are here to work with households and businesses to make sure that they can also participate in our journey and rescuing food scraps and building soil through composting and other solutions that we can talk about later. Now, what made us, it made me and Jaylan, my co-founder, get started on this journey? I, I get this question a lot. And uh, every time I think like, what really made me start? Uh, and I, I don't have one incident like many people who, you know, who just one day woke up and said, I'm gonna do this. I believe in my case, it's, it has been like a culmination of different things that have been happening to me throughout my life. Um, I'm a business major. I don't have an environmental or, or agricultural background. I'm a consumer, like, like an average person, right? And I've been working in business for the past 15 years. And throughout these years, I felt that I want to do something different, something that gives back, something that has an impact, whether environmentally, socially, like something on a bigger scale that I feel I have a purpose, you know, a connection with. So this was one thing. The other thing, uh, like meeting different people, inspirational people who are doing something, you know, in regards to the environment, started giving me some ideas. COVID situation also made me feel that we are part of something bigger than us. And if one thing maybe goes wrong, it can trickle down and affect everyone literally globally, like what happened with COVID. Another thing was um, we had a lot of, and we are still experiencing a lot of forest fires back home in Lebanon or in Turkey where Jaylan is from. And it made me think like, why is this happening? Why are we having these kind of natural disasters? Are they man-made or is it nature or it's a combination of both things? So from one thing to another, like even living in Dubai, 
which gives us a very comfortable life in terms of our purchasing power, uh, having access to food every day, to everything every day, and how we are dealing with waste. Um, we, uh, like Jayla and I, as a household, we recycle everything. But when it came to our food, we did not have a solution that was directly present for us. So we started thinking what we can do as a consumer to make sure this food that is such a precious resource, no matter whether it's you know edible or just a peel, there is something to it. Just like we recycle plastic, metal and glass, we can also recycle and create value of our food scraps. And all of these together, and also from reading a lot of material, watching documentaries, talking to people, we said, let's do something about it. Despite everyone telling us it's gonna be so hard, it's a big mountain to climb, we said, we said we can start small and see where this goes. And so far, things have been great. Of course, we always have challenges like everything in life. And uh, yeah, so this is my answer. It's a lot of things that we pass through as a normal average person who wants to make a difference in my life, in my home and in other people's homes and lives as well. I think that's incredibly beautiful because it's really it's about that essence of wanting to reconnect ourselves back to the world that we find around us. We can keep going through life and be very detached from, like you said, the problems of whether that's forest fires or the issues to do with COVID and everything besides. We we can allow ourselves to be detached. And I'm very, very inspired by your motivation to say, no, we're actually going to do something. And I'm also so excited by the idea of compost, because to me, this is something that personally, I've just always been a bit weird and absolutely loved compost and all the little creepy crawlies in there. And the whole idea that things just can break back down and then reemerge with bursting of, of life again from that, that same um, essence, it, it to me is something that is touching on a connection that is available to everybody that you're saying okay we put this food into the bin and every day we put this food into the bin and that's going to a landfill and I, I do really think it's a very powerful thing for the day to day to reconnect that that actually can have value and I wondered if there's any um Anything you've come across in, in exploring what you're working on here that is an ability, because for many people, compost is actually kind of gross. It's a bit icky, it's a bit smelly. And the idea of making the effort, um, there's just complete kind of disconnect. So I wonder if there's anything that you've found that inspires people or re-engages people with that um, transformation that actually compost is valuable and powerful. Uh, I mean, we work a lot as the Waste Lab to show people, um, you know, the whole cycle of where food, is, where food comes from, what is soil. Uh, we like when we are talking to, you know, our members and we call our customers members because they are our family members as well. We like to show them everything along the way, like from the moment we collect their food scraps, you know, in a bin then transporting it to uh, our composting station. What happens there? We send them pictures, we tell them information. We tell them, come visit, come see what's happening. Try it yourself. Do you smell anything? Do you see anything that is off? And I believe like a lot of this is a lot, a lot of their, let's say, um, uh, what, yeah, what makes them like hesitant to do it themselves is misconception. They have a lot of misconceptions and we are here to break them, right? Because composting, yes, it might seem something uh, very complicated, but it's it's not. It needs a bit of TLC, right? And it's and it's an experience. Maybe the the first pile you do might smell a, a bit, but then you un, you will have to understand why. You know, like maybe you need to add a bit more browns to it. Maybe you need to turn it more. And we, here, we are here to guide people, give them information, make them connect that actually, no, this, this is nature's way of recycling and it's beautiful. And there's a purpose behind it. And the, you know, the moment they, like we give them, you know, like before and after a, a bin full of foot scraps and a bin full of compost. And this, they, they don't really believe sometimes that this actually turned into this. 
and how good the compost smells. It's like, it smells like earth, you know, like soil on a rainy day, you know, and it's the best feeling ever. We tell them, please touch it, smell it, use it. We give them the compost back as well to use it in their garden, in their pots, if they're in an apartment. So it's all about, as you said before, connection, giving them information, breaking any misconceptions. And uh, it's okay to have your fear, to have your doubts. This is why we talk to each other. We, are, we don't just you know, give a guideline, a paper, and tell them this is one, two, three. No, we go into their home. We try to understand their pain point, collect feedback, and tell them you can talk to us anytime. You can visit us anytime, see what's happening there. And on a monthly basis, we make sure that we send them pictures, tell them what's happening, and go beyond you know, the superficial aspect you know, of how it looks like. We also get into the microorganisms, macroorganisms, you know, the whole ecosystem that is involved it's, it's really magical like like you don't need like people ask us do you add anything to your compost to make it uh, faster like no everything and it's magic like the, the bacteria in your food scraps goes into the compost pile and this is also what what happens you know inside to make it break down like it's, it's magnificent and just by explaining this to them and Sometimes like putting faces on everything. Oh, like we talk about uh, the ant because some, or the fly or the larvae. Like when they see it, they say, what is this? Like there's something wrong. Actually, no, these are the, the hard workers that are doing this job of breaking down this food and they're not bad. And uh, we should connect with them because if there is life, it means it's good. If there's no life, then we should get worried. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I really like um, the feeling that you're putting across here in regards to this is essentially waste collection. And we think of that, OK, we've got the bin men coming past. And obviously, that's a different experience in every country, but it's a very them and then this is our house and that they go past and do it, whereas you're in inviting everyone to become a part of this and that transparency is in itself obviously answering the question how do you engage people well we get them involved and I think that's fabulous and it sounds very uh, it sounds very exciting and you're making it um, an education within the service that you're doing as alongside with the research that you've done um, you must have some idea of the quantities of waste that end up in a landfill. Have you come across anything alarming in that regard? Um, yes, so we've done our research and unfortunately landfills are growing. They're not reducing, which is like, which tell you, tells you the whole story, right? Uh, like we have our ambitions and pledges and goals to reduce landfill, but so far it has been growing bigger and bigger. Uh, and um, the consumption per capita has also been growing more and more. And you think like, yes, this means I have more purchasing power. I have more, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable in my life, but it's not about this. We should stop linking me having more money, having better consumption power to waste. Because I mean, um, if you have money, it doesn't mean you have to waste more, right? This should not be linked. Um, so yes. It is alarming because uh, it's just growing. And uh, I mean, like the, the other side of the story is now there is more serious, let's say, um, there are more serious promises to reduce it. There's more consciousness on a national and global level that this needs to be reduced drastically. I mean, I have some numbers. I mean, you know, like every source gives you different numbers. That's why I don't usually say a specific number. Uh, but the, the reality is, it's just going more, growing more and more. That's it. And which, and we should be in the opposite direction for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And when it comes to food waste, that's obviously something that is so easy to, um, if we separate it, we can manage that and turn it into something without a massive facility. Um, it, it's something that anybody can really be involved with. Absolutely. Absolutely. With repurposing, yeah. Absolutely. Like, it, just as you are able to separate your plastics and glass and metals, you can separate your food. And uh, one thing, like, we try not to use the word waste in our language because language is also very important. When people see waste, they think it's gone, there's nothing you can do with it, it needs to go to the garbage or to the landfill. 
food is not wasted until it's wasted. So we, that's why we try to use and we educate ourselves first and and we use this language with our, you know, with the, the people we deal with. We say food scraps, we say leftovers, we say surplus, but we never really use waste in our communication. <laughs> Sometimes we have to just to be able to connect with a person, uh, but we prefer and we're trying to change this because waste is a concept that we learned and we felt comfortable with because it's easy. And when it's wasted, you think you can throw it away and then everything will take care of itself by itself. But no, it's going to our landfill. It's affecting our water table, our health, our air that we breathe. So yeah, we try not to use this word as much as possible, at least with us. Yeah, no, I like that. It's There is a lot of association with words and that, that we need to sort of retweak um, some of these along the way. Because, yeah, like automatically your brain thinks waste, so it's okay to throw it. But no, if you say it's a foot scrap, it's a peel, we start giving names, specific names to everything. This establishes a connection, like why am I throwing a peel? If you understand the story behind the peel, for a banana, to grow one banana, you need 100 liters of water, right? So we, we give them the banana story. This banana needed 100 liter of water. You paid X amount of uh, dirhams in the UAE and that much labor. And it has all these nutrients, okay? So for example, like one thing I would like to talk about, like when we look at food waste and loss numbers, how they also define food waste is basically if you have a banana and you don't eat it, you throw it, this is food waste. But what about the peel of the banana? They don't put it as as part of this number but for us it is actually still a resource that we are throwing away and we should start now like like if we combine the edible and the non-edible part and edible part the numbers are even much higher so again like we also try to explain that this loss is not just the thing the the the, the whole banana that you did not eat it's all it's actually also the peel that you are throwing away because the peel also required water, has nutrients that can go back into the soil. So why, sh why, should, why should it be okay to throw it, right? So yeah, this also like we, we try to, you know, to go into the words, understand them, break them down and really change things because this is how it will also change the way you think and how you see things. Yeah, yeah, once you can see that as something valuable, you're far less likely to dismiss it in the future. It becomes then a new habit, a new way of life. With regards to the actual day-to-day um, -day of the business, this um, you are providing a, a box of some description, a collection box for households and businesses as well, is it? Yeah. So what we do is, uh, so we have different plans, if you're a household or your business, and by business, I mean any business that has a kitchen, it can be a restaurant, hotel, an office canteen, uh, you know, a nursery, anything. For households, we work on a subscription model, because of course, like, we are a business at the end of the day, and we need to also be financially sustainable, right, to be able to operate and to invest what we have and to even grow and the expand our reach with households uh, they receive a bin so this is their collection bin their food scraps collection bin with guidelines on it so they can always see it when they are disposing their food scraps we also send them orientation deck so so they also understand why they are doing this not just the how the why and how they also connect the story like this is going to turn into compost what are the benefits of compost so they can understand the whole picture and also talk about it at home if they want. And we give them the guidelines of what goes into the bin, what we are not currently collecting, because you know we have to limit also what we are collecting based on how big we are right now and how much we can treat. And on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis, we go to your house, collect this bin and give you a clean bin in return for the next collection. And we take this, we transport it to our composting station take care of the composting process and on a monthly basis each household gets an impact report we collect data for each household across all you know all the points from collection to composting so they can see what actually happened to their foot scraps how much we collected what this means in terms of reducing carbon emissions and how much compost they, are, they can expect to receive from their share of foot scraps 
and we try to use as much of again simple language because we don't need to be very scientific here as, as long as it gets the message across it's good and on top of this we partner with other brands and startups who share our values in terms of less waste uh, taking care of the environment and these partners give us discounts and rewards which we can give back to our subscribers because you know uh, taking care of their food scraps is one thing but they can also do other things you know to change their habits and this is why we want to give them access to other good startups other you know great change makers who are offering their services and products uh, to them for businesses it's a bit of a different story because here we go into the kitchen we talk with the chef, we talk with the kitchen staff, understand how they operate, because you cannot apply the same concept to every kind of business. Each one is unique. And we want, we don't want to make things difficult for them. We try to understand how they operate, how much uh, food loss they have on a daily basis, what we can do uh, in terms of collection. Sometimes we need to collect every day, not once a week, right? Because if a restaurant has a, a lot more uh, of uh, food scraps. And we give them the bins, we give them trainings, orientation. It's more like we go there and we try to make sure that they understand what's happening and we, con we offer continuous support. And from there, we collect and we do the composting. And again, we give them the impact reports. Um, and, and currently, uh, we, like, we are focused as the Waste Lab on composting, but we also realize there are other solutions and other channels to repurpose food. So here we, we are starting to partner up with other companies and startups who, for example, use coffee grounds to grow mushrooms. So we are still you know, using and, and creating value and what, whatever residue comes from there, we can take it back and compost it. Or other, another startup who is collecting seeds and creating essential oils out of these seeds. Um, or we can talk about black soldier flies, uh, vermicomposting. I mean, as a startup, we don't want to specialize on all of these things. Why, why do we have to if we, find, if we can find other players who are doing this and partner with them and work together? This is much rewarding and this keeps us focused on doing our thing. So yeah, it's constantly evolving uh, and constantly growing, adding more partners on board. Right now we are in this phase of you know, scaling up our operations to start accommodating businesses because they have bigger quantities and connecting with different partners to work with. I really enjoy that part of um, this expansion and this other yeah. partners and ideas getting on board because it, it it's kind of like you are working alongside nature in the composting itself. This is saying that nature knows how to offer this technology to us and we're we're kind of utilizing that and we're getting on board with that. But you're actually also being inspired by nature in so many ways because you're joining these dots in this symbiotic, um, ever expanding um, relationship, which I, I really feel is so powerful and so important right now because the scale of change, when we talk about problems such as climate change and people can be very overwhelmed and distressed about how big this challenge is. And I always feel that it, it doesn't need to be one massive solution that we wait for here. It's actually the power in the simple and then those connections that keep expanding out. And you're really demonstrating that. And, um, you know, the idea of the vermicomposting and the black soldier flies, these are all, once again, very simple, natural technologies that it, it really is just working together and building those partnerships and those links that that keeps on um and it keeps it exciting for yourselves um i'm absolutely sure that it must be um you know really uh, interesting to know where things are going you don't quite know but that it, it, it keeps building out and and that's that's really um yeah fantastic like we keep getting asked uh, what is your technology we tell them nature is our technology you know, again, we go into the world of technology. What does technology mean? It's actually something that enables or uh, facilitates a process. And it doesn't have to be something shiny, you know, uh, in, a, in a box or it can be something that we have and nature has the best technology. We just need to look at it again, connect with it, understand and learn from it. 
sometimes, you know, a bit of automation here and there is good just because to be able to accommodate bigger numbers and to be, you know, faster. But nature is actually is our technology and we just need to open our eyes, talk to other people, see what they're doing and uh, see what nature is doing and connect things together. In regards to um, not specifically your technology, but your setup, what have you yeah. learned and found that um, you do require and you have used along the way with regards to the composting process? Yeah. So right now we are uh, doing um, residential kind of composting. So we go to a community which has uh, like a certain amount of buildings or villas. And we set up a closed system there. So it is more of a small, smaller scale uh, composting. And for these ones, what we learned is we need to really understand our environment because the data that we have available in, in you know, online resources is mostly catered to the other more you know, Western, easier kind of environments. Here we have a drought. It's very hot. So we need to learn and use it to our advantage because, for example, because it's very hot here, uh, composting happens faster, but this means that it dries out also faster. So we need to find a way to not use a lot of water, but how to conserve the water of the food scraps because they already have its moisture and manage it in a way that keeps it on the right, you know, moisture level. Um, and uh, for example, we, we sometimes use neem powder to make sure that uh, the compost pile does not have these pests or these annoying insects that aren't really that helpful. And we try to always keep our solution nature-based as possible. We don't want to just you know, buy, buy something from outside and apply it without really understanding what it is and why we are using it. We can just understand our environment, see what we can do, and try to find solutions accordingly. Uh, like I said, our next stage now is scaling up. And this is when we start looking at bigger and much larger uh, amounts of uh, food scraps. And for this, we are now getting a land to do some sort of windrow composting. And we call it on-farm composting, not industrial composting, because this land will be a farm, a farm in Dubai in the UAE. Uh, so in this case, we will need more of automation. Uh, it's not going to be just us turning. Like it will start like this for sure. But as we grow, we will need maybe a compost turner to help us speed up the process and manage more food scraps and leftovers faster. Um, for leftovers, for example, we don't want to directly put them in the compost pile because we understand they're harder to break down. They might get smelly and they might, they might attract rodents. What we will do is we will partner up with another company who's doing fermentation. So we do kind of a pre-treatment of the leftovers. And then after that, we go into composting because now it's better it's, and, and more ready to be composted. And there's not going to have, we're not going to have these problems of pests and uh, smell. So we are learning as we go and we are involving as many partners as we see fit and talking to scientists uh, to always have also the scientific backup. And sometimes it's just trial and error, doing a smaller scale, learning how it goes, uh, doing also like we have now uh, someone on board who does food characterization for us. So based on different food types, we are trying to make the best formula for a compost pile with a certain output because you will have different outputs of compost with different you know, mineral and nutri nutrient uh, makeup. So, Again, we are trying to go into data, doing trial and error, a lot of R&D and partnerships who have some solutions that we can incorporate with our operation. Yeah, very exciting. I love the idea of uh, expanding out and having your own farm. Do you see that um, continuing with other, um, with growing on there? Will it be a full circle and you'll use the compost on the land? Yes, so this is like also very important. Like we could have just, you know, um, gone for an industrial land out in the middle of nowhere and just did industrial composting. But this is not who we are. Again, we're not a waste management company who's just here to treat food and just do something with it. Uh, the connection, again, is very important. And the, the, the loop and people to understand what it means to do this and why we are doing this. So this is why we fought a lot 
to get a farmland. And hopefully soon this is gonna happen. We are working on it because it's not simple. There's a lot of misconception that composting and the compost operation should be next to a landfill because we are a waste management company. We're saying no, we are doing on-farm composting. It's actually good for the environment. People should be able to go there and also help us compost, connect. And uh, we are now you know, working with farmers who will use this compost and test it on growing different uh, crops here and have also an R&D space to do uh, healing you know, exercises for the soil. See, like we are living in a desert, but we can also work on the desert. It doesn't mean there is no life. We just need to put back the organic matter, put back the micro and macro organisms. It will take a bit of time, but everything good needs some time, right? And why not? Why do we always have to look for short term quick solutions? We work with our sand here, turn it into soil, do R&D, work with farmers, with permaculturists. There's a lot around and they are willing to do this. And now they understand like why we should be doing this more and more. And yeah, use this land for our composting operation, for using the compost on the farm in our experiments, bringing people, uh, students, uh, anyone actually, who wants to see what's happening there, do workshops there, talk about soil, talk about carbon sequestration, talk about why we are doing this and get their hands dirty. So yeah, it's gonna be like, a, our first land I believe is gonna be like a demo land to see the whole cycle from the food scraps to the composting, to healing the soil and growing our superfoods. And again, the same thing again and again. Yeah, and it goes back to what we started out with really about reconnecting people with how how the world works, how nature works, and re-engaging them with um, the whole education on this just by demonstrating. And it's so inspiring. And I think that it, you know, in itself, the idea of collecting food scraps and then composting it, that you can do within any household. You can find a facility to do that. And I, I always think that's such a wonderful education on the idea of being circular within resources and the economy, but you're doing that on a broader scale and you're providing in, in the service that you're doing is actually educating on and demonstrating a circular economy. And as you've mentioned, it's when we take things and move them away from being industrialized and actually work with nature, we also can localize them. It doesn't have to be people living and then industry right the other side of us, right in a distance. So we can localize and then reintegrate. And I think this is a huge, huge part of the solution ongoing in terms of so many of the world's issues and problems. You know, it, it puts them into the context of self-responsibility and um, being able to see how it all works and everybody becoming a part of that. Like I, I've never been to a landfill myself and uh, many people haven't as well. And they think like what they throw away goes somewhere and it disappears in thin air. No, there's a, there's a mountain of landfill growing every day. So, but just because they don't see it, they don't feel responsible for it. No, we want not just to show them the responsibility, but also give them an inspiration and uh, actually empowerment that they can actually do something. Every single person, every single act counts. And it starts from the house. Like when we started the, you know, with our planning for the waste lab, we got a lot of criticism. Like, why are you even bothering with households? They're not gonna make much of a difference. They're the hardest to impact and they don't really um, give you a lot of financial return. It's one, how, how much are you gonna make from it? It's, and it takes a lot of effort. We said, yes, we understand this. Uh, businesses will probably be easier to tackle because they have their own agenda, their KPIs, their cost savings, their CSR initiatives, all these things. But we need to also focus on the household because the employee of the business is a household, right? And if you wanna really create change in the future, you need to work with the household, with the kids, with every single family member. And this is what actually will drive the change. The business, okay, will do, will do its part, but the, the change will not happen from the business. It's gonna happen from the household. These are the generations that will actually work, become a business and have this you know, mentality, this, uh, this mental space in them that they want to do this uh, difference and make an impact. 
Yeah, I really applaud that, that you haven't taken the easiest, most obvious route. You've you've taken the one that's actually going to blossom and have the biggest impact in the long run. And I think you're absolutely right. Children um, are at the heart of how things are going to move forward in the long run. So they have to be engaged and involved in this. It's going to make such a big difference. When we talk to children, like we learn a lot from them. And they are the ones who go back to their house and tell their parents, we need to do this. We need to compost. They are the biggest influencers we have. So absolutely, you're right. Yeah, and I think that's another thing. It's this idea that everything has to be... um, have its place and when we put waste management as some industrial process it isn't um, offering anything beyond waste management but when we put it as part of the household and part of the day-to-day life it actually becomes education and it becomes fun it becomes um, probably a part of the actual playtime of the children to to in some way engage and learn and read about things and I think you know this again it's just one of those extra steps that keeps it spreading and keeps it building out into a bigger and bigger web of influence and uh, yeah it's it's very very lovely with the context of Dubai where you are obviously you've mentioned the climate is very different in terms of um, western climate the temperatures and the humidity have brought your own challenges and also you've mentioned about the desert the sand and I think that's such a lovely um, to me it's kind of this very visual idea that the resource to yourselves where there's sand and desert all around this resource of compost must feel even more valuable and um, so precious in terms of what it can offer. Um, Is there any other um, restrictions or opportunities that you feel that Dubai in itself its uniqueness offers? Uh, so, you know, Dubai is one emirate in the country. So you have other emirates, Abu Dhabi, Ajman. We are, we start, we are starting in Dubai, but we will be across the country. It just matter because we live in Dubai and we have already some connections here. We thought it's logical to start here. And, uh, as a country, um, it's like, this is the country of opportunities of making things happen, which is wonderful. And this is why we came here. And like 85% of people who live here are expats. So this is like a a very unique mix of people, each one with their different culture, different thinking, different traditions, and how they used to live back, you know, home. So we saw this as an opportunity to start here, prove our point here, you know, show that things can happen, and then expand beyond this. I didn't start from back home, neither did Jayla. We came here, we're living in a place that now we call home, and we see there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of open-mindedness, dy- uh, dynamism, and uh, funding as well. There's a, there are a lot of startups here, uh, and each one in their own space, but there is funding, and there are a lot of eyes on what is happening here. So we thought uh, it's logical to start from here. Uh, Some of the challenges we face, uh, again, when it comes to funding, a lot of it is now focused on tech-heavy startups. And the definition of tech is basically like um, something that is not what we are doing. Our definition of technology, of course, we will have our automation and, um, you know, uh, some here and there, but we are not tech-heavy. We are nature tech. So there still needs some awareness regarding to that and some kind of um, education in terms of impact investment, because this is another, you know, another, how do you say, a group of people who not not just look at the financial return, but also on the impact return. It's still in the, I say, in the infancy phase here, but it's growing and it's coming more and more. So, for us to convince uh, an investor of what we are doing takes more effort, more evidence, more things than if you are an application who's doing uh, online delivery of some marketplace. They, they grasp that concept much more easily than what we are trying to do with the waste app. This is one challenge. The other challenge, which I touched upon a bit earlier, is 
we are categorized sometimes as a waste management company, which we are not. And why, and why we are being like that? Because there's still no category for what we are doing when it comes to licensing, getting permits and all these. They see us, they try to put us in a group, which we are not, but this is what is available. So we are now kind of creating our own activity, our own license, our own category when it comes to these things. And it takes time and a lot of back and forth and education and proving that actually we are not this, we are this. And we, for this, we need new ways of thinking and new permits. So this is another thing. Um, what else? Uh, like, again, let's go back to opportunities. Um, now the UAE is going to host COP28. And this is in like a year or two, right? So now like they are under the spotlight and they need to, how do you say, walk the talk. We've done a lot of pledges here. Now there's a, a new initiative, a nationwide initiative called Na'ma, which is the Arabic word for blessing. And the purpose of this is to make sure that we reduce food loss and waste by 50% by 2030, which is two more, like it's eight years, it's a very short time. And this is by involving different stakeholders, startups, households, uh, government, private companies. So this is a very important pledge. And for this, they need us to be there and more involved and they need to support us. So, yeah, so like, I believe um, the UEE is, uh, how do you say, is starting to act more upon these things. It's gonna take a bit of time and a bit of organization, uh, but it's gonna happen. And we, we have started feeling this. Uh, it's just, we need to readjust some things, um, create new, permits and licenses that are easier for startups to start working. And one thing um, is cost of uh, licensing. It's a bit high now. It's one of the highest in the world. Just to register your startup, you need to pay a lot of money. So this is something also that they are working on to make it more easier and accessible for everyone. Yeah, you, you're very much paving the way. And you're paving the way in an area that is going to become more and more relevant. And and I think that if you're demonstrating the power, then that's what's going to it's going to you know have um, so much impact. If if these people kind of can see that it it ticks the boxes of the ambitions that there is there as a nation. And yeah, very exciting on that on that. And I I think you're doing um, such a wonderful job putting in so much effort and energy into the right area. With regards to um, collecting the waste and the you, you've been in action for, for enough time now to have a little bit of experience of what people are throwing away. Is there anything within there that you can't process that, that people expect you to be able to? So when it comes to um, household level, we are only accepting food scraps which means uh, plant-based food, like uh, uh, veggies, fruits, eggshells, uh, tea leaves, coffee grounds. We are not accepting cooked food or meat. Why? Because we are doing these operations in communities and we don't want to take any risk when it comes to rodents or smells. So we have to limit them there. Uh, and we work a lot on education and giving feedback to make sure that we don't receive any contamination, also in terms of plastic and other kinds of recyclables. So every time we get a bin, we, we check every bin one by one, take pictures, remove the, you know, the things that should not be going to the compost pile and give feedback to the household. This is important. Now, because we are getting this land, we can start accepting, as I said, other kinds, which are the leftovers. We do not, for example, we will not be accepting raw meat and the fish chicken because we think this should be repurposed in another way. It doesn't have, not everything needs to go to compost. And some of these leftovers, like I said, will be pre-treated with fermentation and some will go to other channels. So like our key here in our operation is once we collect, uh, actually, no, our key is first give training and guidelines on segregating at source. For example, a kitchen, we give them three different bins, each one, one is for food scraps, one for leftovers and one, for example, for coffee grounds. And we give them trainings and guidelines as much as possible. We collect, now we have a warehouse, which we are preparing. 
this is the really the integral, integral part of our operation because in this warehouse, we look at each bin we collected, we remove any contamination, we record data, and we can see if we can further segregate based on how we will channel the food, uh, based on also the partners that we have. If one partner wants maybe only lemon peels, if we are able to segregate it, we'll give them the lemon peels and they can process it in their plant to produce something else. So this warehouse allows us for quality control, data collection and further segregation. So we can either take uh, the food scraps to compost or to fermentation or to our other partners. Yeah. And with regards to the partners, this actually excites me so much. The idea that there are, when you put it onto a scale of a business in particular, and you're collecting, say, coffee grounds, or like you've just mentioned, lemon peels, what examples are there of waste that if you have separated it, and then it's a large volume that you can have of that one item, what, what sort of surprising um, items are there that can offer value? I mean, we, to be honest, we are learning this every day. And the thing is, um, because now we are getting approached by startups we were not aware of, but because they know we are putting an effort in segregating from source, which is the biggest that pain is, point for everyone. Yeah. Because once you mix everything, you cannot, it's gone. You cannot just remove one by one. Uh, because we, they know we are segregating, they come and tell us, we are looking for seeds. Would you be able to go into this? We are looking for coffee grounds. We are looking for, like I said, lemon peels. Um, so it's just a matter of finding these partners and understanding their requirements and seeing from where we can get them. Because again, if we work for, for example, uh, a juice shop, this is already segregated. And we can further segregate and tell them, please make sure the lemon peels, orange peels go here, the seeds go here, and we give them the bins and the trainings for this. Um, for example, with the black soldier fly, we know that they love leftover food. So this is a very good, you know, uh, way to treat them and to create, you know, the larvae. If you've heard of this, as once, you know, it's, it consumes uh, the leftovers, their poop is actually a good fertilizer. And then you can dry the larvae for chicken feed and you can also create other kinds of things from it. So like, again, it's a learning experience for us. And uh, we see, for example, one company who is uh, using food scraps to create uh, furniture items or coasters, this is in Turkey. So soon we will get in contact with them and see if we can do something with it. Mm -hmm. So the more we research or the more people get in touch with us, the more we are learning that we can actually separate more and more and just start uh, giving here and there the food scraps yeah yeah it's very wonderful because it's the idea that you can take the food scraps turn them to compost that in itself is extraordinary but then you can actually add to that and provide raw materials that can replace so many and what I notice with this kind of thing is it, it is very problem solving of issues that you wouldn't expect. Like with the black soldier flies, that's creating a very valuable source of protein from waste. And, and that is something that we scratch our heads over in the world. How do we create sustainable protein? And actually from food scraps. And um, there, there's many examples of this. And I suppose with a lot of it, you've, you've really hit the nail. It's about the separation. When you've got a pile full of mixed waste, it's kind of useless to everybody. When you separate that out, there is so much value. And a lot of these items, like say lemon peels, um, they can offer such a versatility of use. And in many cases, they can replace the need for toxic ingredients. Like if you have lemon peels in cleaning or in beauty products, this kind of thing, then um, the, you know, the, the knock-on impacts of, of kind of moving into this circular um, process of resources, it really does come down to, well, can you separate it? Because if you can separate it, you can, you know, the world's your oyster, you've got something so valuable. And um, have you found that really is just a very specific localized solution the separation is at source you are just training people and asking them to to do that for you yes this is crucial part at the, from the household or the business level it needs to start from the kitchen 
otherwise, like we said, it, it's too late. And this is where we spend most of like most of, yeah, let's say most of our effort on because you need to have the content, the guidelines, the trainings, the follow up. We, we don't do just one training and uh, disappear. You need to be constant. Um, right now, for example, we are onboarding one residential building in Dubai. They want to make sure every single uh, unit in the building is separating their foot scraps. So here we are designing like an engagement outreach program for the residents. We are giving them not just the training, we're giving them the orientation, the talk, like why are we doing this? How we can do this? And we are training the building staff how to check for any contamination, give us feedback, give us pictures and data so we can go back and you know go over things again. This is absolutely crucial. And again, here, because we have so many um, different cultures speaking different languages, we need to do things in English, in Arabic, in Hindi, in, you know, in um, Tagalog. So also we need to use different, like literally different languages to reach as many people as possible to understand what we are doing and how to do it. Yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting and so full of potential and uh, yeah, really it, to me, it's something that's very close to my heart because it's something that I I love anything to do with sort of repurposing and uh, composting. And uh, yeah, it, it's it, the, the potential just keeps on going. And I think that's wonderful. And you are such a fantastic example um, of putting your energy into this. And instead of just going straight for the simple, in terms of if anybody because so many people want to do something to help and they sort of sit back feeling like, well, there's nothing they can do. I've not got the expertise. I've not got the experience. Do you have any advice or any thoughts in, in, that you would share with people in that position? Um, so when it comes, like we are here to meet everyone where they are along their journey, whatever, whatever pain points they have, uh, doubts, questions, they come to us. Some people tried composting at home, but found it's too time consuming for them. We have we, we lead very busy lives in Dubai and the UAE. We are very work oriented. And if we live in a small apartment, it's not easy to have a compost bin there. We tell them like, you don't need to do compost. You can give us, you can support a startup here who's trying to do an impact. And we can give you the guidelines that then just separate your food scraps and we will do the composting for you. But you're, you're still doing an impact. You don't need to go and do the compost yourself. You are doing the most important part, which is segregation. Now we are getting a lot of requests, which we believe we will add eventually to our service, those who want to actually do compost at home. Here, we can provide the bin, the composting bin, the, you know, the expertise, the guidelines, what they need to do and the follow up. So this also can work. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of giving people options, not just, like, not just one solution. And uh, because people do have different lifestyles, different requirements, different pain points, we need to be able to tackle each one of them and understand how we can you know, uh, give them the benefit. And um, we recently have, have a new joiner who's focusing on outreach and education because we are also expanding our workshop uh, branch. We have now schools, universities, corporates who want to understand more and more uh, about this food loss and food waste and what they can do about it. They care now. Uh, so we are working on this. Uh, we are giving different content. Like some people just want to learn a bit like composting 101. Others want to go deeper into it. So we are flashing out this content doing uh, uh, hopefully soon a master class that can be accessible to everyone in different languages then doing side visits to our composting operation so they can do it themselves and uh, just keep the conversation going posting on social media like uh, interesting uh, facts and tips uh, what they can do and using story always storytelling we, we are not here to tell them we know better than you no we are like you we decided to do something and you can also, and we speak the same language. We are not here to shame you, to tell you we know better. No, we are actually here to share what we have learned and tell you that you can join us and make a difference with us 
and at the same time support us as a local startup and actually support other startups who are joining us as partners as well yeah that that's it, it it's um it, it seems like you you kind of got that ball moving and now it's just kind of keeping keeping itself going and um, a lot of different opportunities I suppose are coming to your door because you've because you're offering and have built that foundation so congratulations and uh, yeah I, I I'm really excited for what you're doing and I'd love to sort of keep updated because it Absolutely. seems like you're moving all the time have you got any particular ambitions or is this um, growing in a sort of organic way uh, like our ambition, like our passion is soil at the end of the day. And we saw the opportunity, like how can we take care of our soil? And then we talk about food security. We have a lot of food that actually that is being wasted. Why don't we use this as a resource to help the soil and, you know, do our part? So this was that was the very main idea rescuing food scraps building soil this is how we you know we we describe ourselves in, in a couple of lines and from there it's opportunities started coming up you know a lot of learnings uh, sometimes other startups are coming and telling us how about this and that now for example we got a contact uh, by a startup who want to do composting in space and this is like <laughs> absolutely amazing, like composting in space, because there's also food waste in space and they don't want to dispose things in space, right? <laughs> so soon we are going to start working together on identifying the variables that we can incorporate in a composter that works in, in space. Uh, but then again, <laughs> I always say, let's first understand what, hap what is happening on Earth beneath our soil because we don't want to think of plan B for Earth. We want to take care of Earth. Plan okay, it's always good to have um, option B, but let's first work here, understand what's happening beneath our, you know, our feet. There's so much life there that we, we know maybe 5% about. And, um, but yes, uh, why not? We can also compost in space. <laughs> we can do it everywhere. We just need to understand the environment and uh, do something about it. Well, I and love like that. One... <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I love the unexpectedness of uh, where this yeah. can take you because you never expected it to, to be, be up there in yeah, the stars. Like <laughs> yeah, but uh, apparently a compost is important but wherever you are because it's, it's a way of recycling, as simple as that. It's nature's way of recycling. You just need to understand how it goes and apply it based on the environment you are at. Like in the UAE, we import 80 to 90% of our food. And now 40 to 50% of our landfills are made of food scraps and organic waste. So we are also talking about uh, landscape waste. Like it's, we are wasting this resource, which we are importing. Yeah, that, that paints a very, very clear picture, doesn't it, of the opportunity. And then we import 80% of our compost. <laughs> well, like why can't we produce it locally, right? Since we're already paying so much money and resources to bring it here, let's use it, whether as compost or, like we said, as a byproduct of another, you know, uh, product at the end of the day. So that's what as simple as that, what we're trying to do. And all the time thinking of soil, how we can heal the soil and transform it uh, into a carbon sink, into a place to grow our food and veg fruits and vegetables. And actually just walking in a place that has good soil that is planted with green makes you happier as a person absolutely right? as simple as that like it reduces the heat gives you something nice to look at and really calms your mind last sunday jaira and i went to a local farm here a beautiful organic farm it was also taking care of the soil and hopefully we'll be working with them as well to test our compost we just felt you know calm when we went there all the stress went away and uh, i started feeling more creative again felt more grounded like just that this is enough for us to do this yeah yeah you cannot over exaggerate the number of benefits that that come from from that that initial seed of just yeah starting the composting and um yeah well very best of luck it's I, I'm imagining that you're very busy, but it's all very exciting and very worthwhile so yeah do keep us updated. Yeah.
Yeah, we should every couple of months have a call or so just to let you know the new things that are coming because every day is a new day and it's bringing new things on the table. It's, it's absolutely mad, but it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. I think that we'd learn so much. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and your sharing. It's uh, <laughs> such an incredible story. Thank you, Helen. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch for sure. <laughs> And thank you for listening to this episode of We Are Carbon. Next time, we'll be joined by Peter Lundgaard for a closer look at what it takes to manage land holistically, as he draws on his decades of experience practising regenerative agriculture. Please note that this next episode will be in two weeks' time, so be sure to use the lull to catch up with anything that you've missed. You can keep up to date with everything from We Are Carbon by subscribing on the website or following along on Instagram search for wearecarbon.earth and let's keep figuring this all out together.